Bom dia a todos e a todas. Bom, vou mudar para o inglês agora. So, hello everybody. Uh, today we have the pleasure to receive Professor Leopoldo Pando Zayas. Uh, as far as I could find, he's from Cuba, but he did his master and PhD studies in Moscow, Russia. Uh, he got his PhD degree in 1998. Then he was a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, United States. Then at the University of California in Santa Barbara, also United States. And uh, finally, I think at ICTP, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. Right now, he's a professor of physics at the University of Michigan and also staff associate at ICTP in Trieste, where he is right now. So thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. Uh, now it's with you. Let me just uh, tell uh, the title of your talk. So he will uh, talk to us about quantum entropy of holes in holography. So it's with you now. Thanks a lot. Um, so let's see how the sharing works. Sorry. No. Yeah, I can see your presentation. It's not a, in the presentation mode yet, but okay. yes, now it is. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, sorry for this uh, typo in the title. It's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pressure uh, to talk about this uh, exciting stuff. Um, again, the key thing for me is to convey um, you know, some excitement, some new ideas that are happening in, in high energy physics in the string theory. Um, so I'm happy to, to engage in discussion. Um, so let's, let's see how this goes. So my talk is, of course, about the quantum entropy of black holes in holography. So I will try to unwrap uh, the, what's going on in the title. Um, as I was introduced, thank you for the introduction, Carl. And um, so I'm supported by DOE and, uh, and um, so first of all, I wanted to let's see. I wanted to to sort of clear a little bit some some uh, some dust that might be. So black holes are fascinating objects. So there was uh, recently the 2020 Nobel Prize was um, largely because of work of Roger Penrose and Gensel and Guess. Uh, so it's very easy to start to talk about black holes because they are constantly in the news. And uh, so this is the most recent big news about black hole. Then there was a Event Horizon Telescope last year that you probably have heard about, I'm sure. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about something exciting and observational. I'm a, I'm a string theorist. I'm a very theoretical, almost mathematical person. So I'm going to talk about some quantum aspects of black holes. Uh, and moreover, these are a special kind of black holes. They don't live in, in our space, they live in an in a idealized space, which is called anti -decider. And this is essentially, you can think about this as a hyperbolic space. So instead of being a sphere, where you, you have x squared, y squared, z squared equal one, you have some negative sign in between. It's like a, like a hyperbola. In that. All right, so I have uh, many, many collaborators. Some of them started when they were undergrad students. Some of them are my PhD students. Some of them are now faculty. Uh, here's the list of slightly more senior collaborators. Some of these uh, you will see uh, when, when I cite concrete works. So let's, let's start from the beginning. So the origins uh, of black hole thermodynamics. This is sort of the topic, so let's start uh, getting into what I want to talk about. So black holes, it was established in 1973, uh, around 1973, that there's, they, they satisfy some laws and that these laws, they, they look incredibly close to what we know as, as thermodynamic laws. So there's a zero law of thermodynamic and the analog for black hole is that the surface gravity in the horizon is a constant. Then there's a first law that says that the change in the mass of the black hole is proportional, kappa is again the, the surface gravity, proportional to change in the area and change in angular momentum. So this really looks like a thermodynamics law. Then there's a second law that says that the area of the event horizon is always increasing. So that means the area serves more or less as, a, as an entropy in, in this analogy. And um, so just to, to get an idea of the numbers we're talking about, uh, so if you have a solar, a, a solar mass black hole, it will have this entropy, 10 to the 77. 
And that entropy is 10 to the 20, 20 orders of magnitude bigger than the entropy, the thermodynamic entropy of the sun. So that already is telling you that there's a very quantum uh, process going on. So if a, if it's a sun were to collapse to, to form a black hole with that mass, it will have a lot more entropy than thermodynamics. So that is one of the initial puzzles that we have in, in, in black hole thermodynamics. Now, what I just told you that the, the nature, the very nature, what is, what is, what is that kind of entropy uh, coming from is already very, very mysterious. Um, but more importantly, we would like to understand the origins. We would like to understand uh, this entropy a little better at the statistical level even, right? So we know that entropy is, is related to counting some degeneracy, to counting uh, possible number of degrees of freedom. So that's something that we would like to understand. Now, the black holes, they, they present by themselves a lot of other puzzles. Like there's the, once the black hole evaporates, so there's nothing in its, in its place. And, and you might wonder what happened to the, to, the, to the information that went into forming a black hole. Is that completely lost uh, to the universe? And that will violate some of the laws of, of quantum mechanics. So from the very beginning in the 70s, uh, there were all kinds of uh, questions. And of course, whenever people are arguing, now when you argue, you just open Google and find the answer. But in the 70s, people used to make bets, like, oh, I bet that you're wrong. I bet that I'm right. And after a long time, people would decide. Now, uh, if you follow this news about black holes, so you know that in the um, recently, oops, it's not, I can see this well. Uh, Hawking had conceded a bet, and that made it to a number of, of newspapers. So the New York Times wrote this article in 2004 about those first on black holes saying that, well, Hawking conceded his bet, so he lost, he, uh, he, uh, he accepted that black holes do not destroy information, that there's some possible explanation for, for what the, how the information comes out of the black hole. And of course, the you know, physics world had its own article, and there was an other article in the American Physical Societies. So this was a big news. Um, and the main reason, if you go into the details uh, of this concession, is that uh, is this uh, ADS-CFT correspondence. This is also known as holography. This says that um, in some situations, not always, but in some situations, you can have a mathematical equivalent. So here on my left, I wrote the partition function of a theory. That's the package that has all the information about the theory. So the partition function of a quantum field theory, like particle physics, the standard model, this kind of quantum field theory, can be equal to a partition function of a theory that contains gravity. Einstein, gravitons, all that kind of thing. So this is an amazing uh, statement. But if this statement is true, if you agree that this is true, then any question that I had in gravity on this, on this right-hand side is answered in terms of quantum field theory. So therefore, all I'm the Sorry to that we, interrupt. Yes. We can see only the title of your slide. Uh, do you have equations on it or? Yes. No, we cannot see them. Oh, this is, um, mm. I don't know how to fix that. Maybe you oh. can uh, stop sharing and try sharing okay. again. Let's try Just that. Uh, last week, uh, the speaker had to keep it uh, not in the presentation mode. Well, how now about we, now? We can, yes, you can see but the it's not the same as before, is it? The title is different now, but we can see equations. You see equation, you see that on the left hand side, I have a quantum field theory, which is unitary, follows the laws of quantum mechanics. So information is preserved, etc. So this is an answer to the, to the many puzzles in, of the 70s. But the answer is implicit. The answer is not clear. And that's sort of what I want to talk about. Uh, trying to make the, you know, explain how this works and, and what can we do. Can you see my formula for the entropy of a black hole? Yes, yes. Awesome. So a good place to start understanding this question is, of course, the black hole entropy. The black hole entropy is given by this formula. So A here is the area of the black hole horizon. So the formula is very, very nice, very geometric. So it tells you the entropy is proportional to the area. Then you have Newton constant, and you expect that because it's in a gravitational theory. But then you also have H bar that tells you this is a quantum uh, entropy. And that's why we now understand, ah, that's why it came out to be so large. 
for a solar map black hole because you have h bar in the denominator. And then there are questions about relativity because you have the speed of light and also Boltzmann. Now, the problem that we want to address is the following, right? So we know in a gas, the gas has some pressure, but at the end we understand the pressure is because of motion of molecules and there's some microscopic, more fundamental explanation for that observation that we have of a pressure of a gas. So the same thing we would like to do for the black hole. The black hole has some entropy and we know that entropy can be, we can, we can view it as a macroscopic. So how much heat you can transfer from one body to the other. But ultimately entropy is a microscopic object and we expect to find the configurations of, of the, let's say the molecules that make the black hole to found them and then get the entropy. That's really the problem of this area. This, this is the microscopic origin of black hole, and that's what I plan to discuss in more detail. Now, oh, oh this is, uh, I see, I see, okay. Uh, uh, all right, so let me, let, me, let me explain now in more details what, what I want to tell you. Uh, in, in, so I just mentioned that this is the formula that, that is very famous, the, the one quarter of the area of the black hole in the 70s. That is what happens at leading order, right? This is like, if you are doing, so people like to say that the black hole is like the hydrogen atom of quantum gravity, right? So if you understand the black hole, you will understand quantum gravity. Um, and if you follow that analogy, this area divided by four is like the board levels. So it's, uh, it's like the, the most important part but then we know that there are corrections, finite structure constant, there are all kinds of corrections in the energy levels of a hydrogen atom. So these are some of the corrections to the entropy of the black hole. There's the, in the circle, the quarter of the area is the main piece, but then there are corrections. Some of them are, are called logarithmic corrections because they are proportional to the logarithm of the area of the horizon. And they come with a coefficient, this coefficient beta, it's a quantum coefficient. It's, it, it, it counts, uh, in a sense, it is the contribution that comes from fields that run in the loop, in, in the quantum loop. As, as you know, in quantum field theory, the vacuum is not an empty space. It's a space full of virtual particles. These particles run in the loop, and that's, uh, that they contribute to this coefficient beta. So what I'm going to tell you in, in more precisely is how we calculate this coefficient, this correction to the entropy, using the gravity side and using the field theory side. And of course, I wouldn't be here if they, done, if they did not agree and, and we understand this picture much better. All right, so what I'm going to use is, again, is, is the gauge gravity correspondence of ADS-CFT. This is, um, this is uh, a picture from a, 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 point, a viewpoint article that I wrote for the American Physical Society explaining a lot of recent developments in this in this field and that's why uh, this is sort of a background that i particularly like um, so now let's 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 uh, i know I, I hope there are many students in the audience so i want to to, to talk directly to them uh, so when when i was in uh, i was i went to high school to a science high school in cuba and uh, one of my colleagues one of your colleagues juan carlos uh, is, is a friend of mine from, from those days. And he, he will tell you that I was, uh, I was very ex always in this physics competition. So I like this kind of mathematical riddle. So one natural question is, if, if how many ways can you break a $20 bill, right? That's a, if you, if you have the nomination of one, five and 10, and the answer to the problem, you can just, you can do it many ways. You can just, you know, think about it and say, okay, I can have 20 times $1 or, you know, one, five, and, and you count the configurations and you get nine. Then I can ask a slightly more general question. In principle, if I ask you, okay, how, how many ways are there to, 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 to break $1 million? So that question would be a little harder and you cannot do it by hand. You have to come up with techniques to do this kind of counting. These techniques are very well known in statistical mechanics. They are called generating functions. So here I wrote, I, I hope you can see this. So this is the generating function that gives you that gives you the answer to this question of how to partition uh, dollar bills in ones, five and ten. So I have to expand this and the coefficient of the of the of the term 
t to the 20 is going to be nine. And if I want, but then, then you can see another problem. If I want to do it to a million, then I need a much bigger computer. So it's better to find something analytic. But all, I, all I'm saying is that the question, this statistical question of giving a total, a, 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 a big quantity, how many ways I can, I can build it out of a smaller building block, it's a question that is well known in, in statistical mechanics. And in fact, in, in Peter and Kramer, I have taught uh, StatMech, uh, and I hope that you, well, I, I don't know if you use the same book, but this is one of the chapters. So how to count and how to, and what I'm going to tell you is of course, a lot more complicated than this, but at the heart of the exercise that I'm going to explain is this kind of counting. So finding some generating function through which you will get your answer to what is the entropy of a black hole, right? So let me make now the leave the, the area of money and go to the area of, of the black hole, which is where, where, I, where I'm, uh, I'm interested. So if I have a black hole of a given mass, charge, and angular momentum, uh, this is like having the total amount of dollars, right? That's the, the macroscopic uh, observation. And then I want to know how many ways I can form that black hole. So I want to con con count how many microscopic states make that black hole, and that will give me the entropy, all right? So that's, that's the answer, all right? Now, I want to do that in field theory, remember, because I have the ADS-CFT correspondence that tells me your very complicated problem in gravity maybe has an easier solution in field theory. And in field theory, we know how to construct a partition function. Partition function, generating function, this, are the, this is the gadget, in which you answer this question. So I'm going to, to tell you just very, very roughly the kind of partition function that we like in a string theory, although of course this is a field theory. So this term, this term, I don't have to explain, right? This is something you know from, from Kittel and Kramer. This is a statistic mechanic 101. So I want to weight all the states and I sum over all the states in my theory, weighting uh, with, with this inverse temperature. All right, now, if I have conserved quantities in my system, I have like a charge, then I, I use the charge and chemical potential. And now, there's another, there's an extra symmetry that is very useful in physics. In principle, computing this object would be very hard, but then if I insert this term here, the minus one to the F, that is called, that turns this partition function into something that, that is called with an index, but what that means is that, if the state over which I'm summing is a boson, I get F equals zero. So I, the sign is positive. But if the state is a fermion, then F is one, and I, get, I have to count it with negative sign. So it turns out that this partition function can be computed, um, can be computed using some techniques, and that's, that's the answer to, 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 to the problem. But let me, let me roughly, I, I said I'm doing my counting in quantum field theory, so let me roughly, Again, explain what kind of field theory. So if you're not familiar with this kind of diagram, it doesn't matter, but the important thing is that the theory that I'm using to do the counting of the black hole is a churn simon matter theory. So these are, this is a theory that people who do condensed matter know is related to quantum Hall effect and, and et cetera. So it's, it's just a, a bit of version of that theory in which in that case you have two gauge groups and you have different levels, k and minus k, and then you have fields that are in the bifundamental representations. So they transform with respect to this case group, but that's it. At the end of the day, some complicated uh, chen simon theory. For that chen simon theory, I told you that I, I'm interested in computing the partition function. This is this called the index because it had this funky minus one to the f, but that helps you just computationally. You can compute this exactly. In fact, it's a little bit of a magic, but you can compute this. It, the formula doesn't matter, and, and I would have erased it. But the key thing is that I wanted to, to mention, because I, I know many, there are many condensed matter physicists in the, in, the, in the audience, that this is an instance where high energy theory borrows uh, from, from condensed matter, because the solution is given as a beta ansatz equation. Um, but again, that, that, that's technicalities that I don't want to go into. The summary is that to compute this partition function that counts how many states I have, all I need to do is to give it some chemical potential, solve my beta ansatz equations. It's, it's now a, a numerical problem. 
and then insert that into my partition function and I have my answer. And my answer is exact in N. N, I haven't convinced you yet, but N is related to Newton's constant. So it's a quantum answer for the entropy of black holes. And in fact, uh, this is what, what I did in, uh, in one of my publications. And um, so you get the leading piece. So N, again, think of N as a large number, although it was the rank of the, of the gauge group. So this is the, this part, this is the partition function, but this part will go to give you the area divided by 4G of the black hole when you do your Legendre transformation. And then I have this piece, little piece here, which goes uh, to give me the logarithmic corrections. Okay, so in fact, um, okay, I, I will not say much more about that. So we now know from the field theory, not only the main piece, the, ba the big chunk that makes the, the if you want for a solar mass black holes, this would be a 10 to a 77. I also know a little bit about the exponent, the 77. I know this kind of correction. This is a very small correction. It's quantum, but I now have computed it in, in quantum field theory. Now, the goal is to go and try to compute it in gravity. Okay? So I, I don't know what is your, your, um, your format, but uh, if, if anybody has questions at this point, I think this would be a good point to, to address those. And then I, I will switch to, to, another, uh, to the other side. So. If, Again, if, if you're, the, you're the boss, so if you tell me no, we yes, only no, ask question question at the question. end. Uh, he can. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> um, when you, you had, you had um, in, a, in a previous view graph, you had the gas and, and molecules, and then we know that the entropy is connected to the degrees of freedom of the molecules. So yes. what are the degrees of freedom What's the nature of the degrees of freedom in the case of a black hole, in the, in the entropy of a black hole? Right, so that we don't know. That we don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, the, the short answer is we don't know. Now, you can ask me, what, what do you count here? You now gave me an answer to a counting problem. Uh, what yeah. were you counting, right? Yeah. That one yeah. I can answer. So I, because I told you I'm working in this theory. This is, uh, this, okay, this is a Chern Simon theory. And here I have operators that have certain charges, and I have simply counting all the operators that they are called one half supersymmetric. So they, they have certain charge and they have certain. So these are creation <laughs> operators. Yes, I have counted what, now. What do they create? <laughs> In the field theory, they create the, the, the corresponding operator. In the field theory, it's very clear what they do. I don't know what they do in gravity, but because I have ADS-CFT, I do my counting in a place where I very clearly know what I'm doing. So and all I you know, know that this is related to gravity. All you know is that there must be a corresponding field because of, of, the, of, the, of the ACS correspondence. That, that's the no, idea. No, the, yes, but also because these, these are conformal theories. In, in a conformal theory, there is an operator state correspondence, right? And uh -huh. uh, so I can count the operators and I know that for sure there's a state that corresponds to that. And then okay. the connection with gravity goes through ADS-CFT correspondence, correct. Okay. And that's where you stop. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so, there's a question in the chat. Uh, what's delta A? Right, so these are chemical potentials. So these are theories with various global charges. So normally in, in, in condensed matter, we think of chemical potential as number of particles. But in fact, you can generalize it a little bit and think if you have a global symmetry, you can introduce a chemical potential for the symmetry and count in, in terms of that. And I didn't say, but NA, so thanks for the question. NA here is magnetic flux. So I'm talking about uh, these, are, these are magnetic fluxes. So let me, let me just a statement that I have more recently done this computation for a, a large class of, of Chern-Simon theories with different complicated uh, kinds of matters, and I always get uh, uh, this minus one half log of n. So this is some more recent work. Now let's let's try to see what happened in the black hole. So here's the metric of the black hole. So if you're familiar with in the Schwarzschild metric, this term would be one minus two m over r, right? If you remember how to write the metric of the Schwarzschild black hole, this is the simplest black hole in flat space. It sort of looks like this, but what is in the parentheses is different. 
So these black holes are asymptotically ADS4. So instead of one, instead of going to a flat space, they go to, um, they grow uh, at infinity. So this is the sign that they are in anti decider space. Remember, I told you uh, I, I am in ADS. And then this NA appeared in the gravity side as magnetic charges of the black hole. And the entropy of the black hole is a complicated function. So here I just gave you, uh, you know, some flavor of what it looks like. So is this a square root of F2 plus a square root of theta, and they are all polynomials of, of the charges. And that precisely agrees with the leading piece that I computed in field theory. So that, for many people, and myself included, is a big uh, proof that you are on the right track. But of course, this is not what we want. What we want to do is to now, this, was a this is a gravitational background, and this is the classical solution. I now want to look at the fluctuations around that classical solution to compute my logarithmic correction, all right? Which is uh, what I want to do. Before I tell, I do, I, I explain roughly how to do that. I want to mention that logarithmic corrections um, are determined from the gravity solution macroscopically, uh, and they depend only on the massless part, part of the spectrum. And they are insensitive to a number of UE ultraviolet properties of the theory. They are a little bit like anomalies. So, the standard model would have been anomalous if you add too many fermions, right, with the, with the wrong charges. So this is the kind of consistency that I can do at the level of gravity. I don't know what is the ultimate theory of, of gravity, but I know that it must have this, this kind of terms, all right? And the rest is not, is not so important. So again, how are we going to compute this uh, quantum fluctuation? So we have some fluctuations around your solution. The fluctuations, we'll, we can limit ourselves to quadratic fluctuations. Then when you integrate them, you will get some determinant, right? It's some standard quantum field theory, not even without interactions, just you integrate the quadratic fluctuations, you get determinants. Now these are determinants of infinite dimensional matrices. So you have to find a way to deal, but that is well understood. There, there are heat kernel techniques that help you to do that, and, and when you are determined, when you're finding the determinant, you have to make sure that you do not include eigenvalues of, of this operator that are zero because you're the product of, of something that contains zero is zero. So you have to be very careful doing this computation. But um, after you know, after some work, um, you compute. So let me give you just the key facts. So this object, um, this computation is very robust. As I explained, it doesn't depend on the ultraviolet scale. Uh, if you're doing your computation in 11 dimensions, as I will, in, in, in odd dimensional space, uh, then certain contributions cannot arise. It's a little bit like anomalies. So anomalies arise only in even dimensional spaces. But in, in odd dimensional spaces, there are no anomalies. So your answer for your one loop partition function, right? Remember, this is the partition function. I computed Z on the field theory side, now side. Now I'm computing z at one loop on the gravity side, right? And um, and then it will be given essentially by the number of zero modes, and and how I treat those zero modes is encoded in this beta. And d r is because I have many operators to sum over. So I know this might be a little bit abstract. Um, so let me try to make it more precise. So the theory that I that I consider is this 11-dimensional supergravity. That's where these black holes actually live. In that theory, at the, at the massless level, I have a graviton. It's a super gravity theory, so I have a gravitino. I also have some, a three form is like a, a, a Maxwell field, just like a photon, but instead of having, you know, the photon would be a mu, but this is a three form, so this would be a new row. So you have three legs. It's a, it's a slightly more complicated object, but at the end of the day, you can treat it conceptually as, as you treat a photon. And then to constate the photon, course, you know that you have to, to do gauge fixing and add goals. So there's some technical aspect, but at the end of the day, um, you can compute the number of zero modes using a little bit of topology, the Euler character characteristic of the black hole, and, uh, and understand how this uh, contribution come together. So this, after you have the partition function, of course, you can get the entropy using a standard uh, STAMEC. And the answer that you get in field theory is precisely, is, is this one is precise, it's sorry, in gravity, is precisely what you got in, uh, in field theory. So that tells you uh, that there's, um, 
there's impressive agreement between the two methods, even beyond the leading piece at subleading order. And, and you see, right, so this was a quantum computation in supergravity. There were many fields running in the loop, like this graviton and gravitino, and the contribution comes out to be uh, precisely what, what we have from field theory. Now, this, this is an old, well, relatively old, uh, 2018 uh, paper of mine with uh, my former student, Vimal. And um, Wenli Zhao is now a PhD student in Princeton. He was on the grad in Michigan at the time, uh, very talented. And then my colleague, Jim Liu. So this is the kind of, uh, of things, again, just talking to students, that an undergrad student can, can participate. So there are, of course, many complicated conceptual stuff. But at the end of the day, to compute the index, I told you, you need to solve a better answer equation. So it's a 2n by 2n system. You have to compute it. You have to feed it. And, and that, that's where, you know, Wenli was very good. And then, of course, there were some issues of topology. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. So more recently, with, uh, with Yu Xing, we have extended this type of analysis to a more general class of black holes. So the black hole that I described uh, was ADS4 asymptotically and the CD4 times S7, the seven-dimensional sphere. Now I can substitute that by some other seven-dimensional spaces. They have names that if, if they don't tell you anything, but they are like twisted sphere. They are more complicated uh, spaces. And even for that space, for those spaces, again, you do the computation on the gravity side and on the field theory side, and you always get agreement. So this is more, more recent work with, uh, with Yushin, who's now a student at uh, Cambridge University in England. Um, and this can be further extended to, to other situations where the black hole, the horizon, need not be a sphere. So when, when a sphere has the, the genus, G here is the, the genus of the sphere. So the sphere has genus zero. It's a genus zero Riemann surface. That's what I was talking all the time about minus one half. But if I now have a, a black hole with a horizon that is a Riemann surface of genus G, arbitrary G, the contribution changes. But again, it continues to match on both sides of, of the correspondent. And these have been uh, generalized to other situations. Uh, so good. So, so the, another, another, there are other, another type of ADS4 black holes. I told, I talk about these black holes that come from generalization of the seven sphere. But there are all this class of black holes in uh, in a string theory, and they come from. This is a hyperbolic three manifold, and this is a, a squash S4. It's a completely Sorry, different. I think there's a question. Sure. Yeah. He has his uh, hand raised, so that's why I thought uh, there was a question. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I was okay. muted, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so you have uh, black holes with different uh, genus? I mean, different black holes may have different topologies? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's, po I mean, exactly. So in, uh, in asymptotically flat spaces, uh, that might be limited. There's a Penrose uh, Hor a Penrose Hogging theorem about the, the, the topology of the horizon, but that is not true in asymptotically ADS space. There you have much more um, uh, options. And in particular, you, have, uh, you can put a, gener a generic uh, Riemann surface as a, as a horizon topology. Can, can they have a, a topological phase transition as they evolve in time? I mean, can they change topology? I mean, I can do that with a topological insulator. I can drive it to, to a non-topological insulator phase, um, applying, for example, strain. So uh -huh. can you have a phase transition, in, a topological phase transition in, in black holes? I don't know. I, 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 don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to speculate too much. I, I know that I can have black holes with different topology in, in they exist as solutions of the supergravity equation. Now, whether there are transitions among them and how are those transitions driven, I, I don't really know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so, so there's this other class of black holes uh, in which instead of a seven dimensional manifold, you have this kind of uh, fiber bundle. And for those, I, we also did the computation. Now the computation is a little bit more complicated on both sides. On the field theory side, you have to use some advances in mathematics uh, that comes from understanding the, 
the partition function of chern simon theories in, in arbitrary uh, hyperbolic three manifolds. And on the gravity side, the, the contribution that I discussed at the beginning comes from a two-form, but now there's another, there's another contribution that is characterized by this. This is a betting number. Betting number essentially tells you how many non-contractible circles or cycles you have in your manifold. Now they can be, that is not necessarily zero, so you, you end up having uh, a more general type of correction. But again, the correction completely matches with uh, the field theory computation. All right, so one last, uh, okay. So probably if you have heard about ADS-CFT, you have heard about ADS-5 process five. So in fact, the spaces that I was talking about are not the most sort of prominent, right? So it, the standard, the canonical prototypical example of ADS-CFT is really ADS-5 times S5 dual to n equal four. This is for maximally supersymmetric uh, young mill. So this is the canonical example. And you wonder, uh, what are you telling me about this, the, the most important example? And what happened is quite of an interesting story. So in, in 2005, uh, Maldacena and various collaborators, they tried. They tried to do this counting for, for black holes in ADS-5, but um, but there was there was no agreement, and uh, and they sort of uh, explained or, or they they guessed that what was going on is that this negative one to the f that you use to compute, essentially, it can give you a lot of cancellation, right? So if bosons and fermions contribute more or less at the same rate, you will get with something that is uh, that is very small and can never account for the large entropy of. Uh, of, of a black hole, which is, uh, as I told you at the beginning, is much more larger than any thermodynamic entropy of, of their similar body. Now, recently at the end of 2018, and this is uh, three different groups, realized that there's, a, there's um, a modification that you can do to this counting, and then it will account correctly for the entropy of black hole. And this is precisely uh, what uh, the American Physical Society asked me to, to explain in my viewpoint uh, article whose background um, I, I live in. But uh, the important thing is that, again, the story there, you're now trying to compute, let's, let's go to the field theory. The field theory, you have a four-dimensional field theory, which is maximally supersymmetric, and you're again interested. Now, because it's supersymmetric, this is, this is my Hamiltonian. See, same type of partition function. Any, you know, again, any, any textbook, tells you that use trace of e to the minus beta h, that is here. Then I can decorate it with different um, charges, right? These are, again, this, this is what I previously wrote as delta a q a, right? And now these black holes, they have rotation with angular momentum j1 and j2, because you are in five dimension. So this is your partition function, all right? I mentioned black hole, but again, I, I remind you that this is a partition function in a well-defined field theory that has been studied for a long, long time. And in that, we can do the computation. I, I Again, I don't want to bury you with formula, but I, I decided to leave this intermediate formula here because this gamma is the elliptic gamma function, but the elliptic gamma function is, at the end of the day, a gamma function. And if you remember what are gamma functions, at, you know, at their own core, they are generalizations of factorial. So you can see that all my ingredients are really counting. When, when if, if you did the exercise that I proposed to you at the beginning, or you open a, a Kittle and Kramer, you will see that the answer for the generalizations is always some kind of factorial, right? So for the for the harmonic oscillator, for the the two two state system, all this counting always end up in some sort of factorial. So here it is, a, is again, a factorial is just that it's, you know, a much more complicate, complicated factorial than, than the one you're used to in a stab make, but nevertheless, you can study it. And that's what we did with, uh, with my, here, uh, Alfredo is my student, he's actually graduating now, a CIS student from Italy, and uh, Jun Ho is from Michigan, a student from Michigan, also graduating, and then my colleague, uh, Jin Liu. So what we did was to compute this partition function Exactly, right? So, so we reduce the, comp the problem to a problem where we have a partition function of Chern Simon theory, which is a well known object in mathematics. So, this is the function of n. 
and then there are some some terms so we obtain in, in again if if you agree with the corresponding we obtain the full quantum entropy of the dual black hole because this is a, an expression that is exact in n and then we use different methods but in whatever method we use to compute we obtain that the coefficient of the logarithm is was one in this theory okay these are five dimensional uh black holes um so now we have and more recently people have reproduced uh our results from from different methods using effective field theory uh but always the answer the answer doesn't change it's, it's log of n so one natural question is and we get this log of n from the gravity side and again i will not tell you that full story and also because my slides uh, got mixed but recently again with uh, with my students uh alfredo and uh, marina in, who's a student in michigan we answered this question from from the gravity side and obtained agreement uh, also for these black holes so um I'm, I'm going to to, to basically uh, essentially state clearly that so now we have not just counting of black hole microstrates using ADS-CFT, we have precision counting. So we can go to subleading terms, very subleading, like these logarithmic terms, and we understand them in both sides, and, and we see that they agree among a, a large range of black holes. Um, and I think this is really the main progress that we have achieved uh, over the last uh, five years, more or less. And uh, now, as I said at the beginning, the information paradox is conceptually vacuous in the context of ADS-CFT because we are describing gravity using a unitary theory, so nothing can be lost. But what we were lacking or what we are still lacking is how, right? So how exactly is information being recovered what is going on? But to answer those questions, I think uh, we are now in a, in a good place because we have understood uh, the counting. So how the process of Hawking radiation is reformulated in a standard field theory, we still don't know. Uh, but I have also um, a little bit of progress along that direction with my uh, postdoc Junyan. And, um, and I think more generally, well, one thing that, that is becoming clearer is that there's a, some universal description of entropy and its correction that, that doesn't necessarily need the full blown uh, description of quantum gravity. Sometimes um, the paradigm of effective field theory can be, can be useful. Uh, in fact, in the five dimensional problem, the solution that we provide is a solution that doesn't necessarily use uh, all the all the details of the of the dual field theory, but essentially focuses on on some more effective techniques. So I hope uh, that I have given you some flavor of these developments, of the exciting things that might come. And uh, with that, I think I want to finish. Uh, my last slide is this one. I wanted to advertise. I helped run in the Simon Center for for Geometry and Physics. Um, COVID forces force us to to postpone a workshop. And, and school, and but but we are going to have such an event in October 2021. And uh, and I again, if you are interested, you should tune in. If you are a student, there will be talks and and, and lecture notes uh, on that on that web page. So thank you very much. Thanks for the interesting talk. So I will invite people to unmute the microphone so that we can thank the speaker. And the section is now open for questions, comments. Anyone? Maybe I can do a very basic question. Please. So you told us about uh, going to 11, a dimension equal to 11, dimension equal to seven. How do we know uh, what to choose? Why do we need all these dimensions? Uh, okay, good, good. Uh, <laughs> right, so, yeah, so, so I will answer in, in different, at different levels. So in the context of a string theory, this is where 
you know, this is the dimension in which we operate, 10 or 11. And these black holes, um, so I first talk about the black holes, ADS4 times M7, so seven dimensional space. So all together they live in 11 dimensions. The second part, I talk about black holes, ADS5 cross S5, they live in 10 dimensions. So these are the dimensions where string theory lives. And now you, you might ask, okay, why, why, is that, uh, how, why is that the case? So when you try to, so string theory has a very clean uh, starting point. So suppose that elementary particles are not point, they are strings, they are one dimensional objects. Now you try to quantize that object and you realize that precisely the same idea of anomaly. So if you quantize the string, the, the Lorentz symmetry would be broken unless you are in 10, in 10 dimensions, let's say, or 11 dimensions. So that's why we believe that that's where the theory makes sense. So now I am not a phenomenologist, so my job is not to, to reconcile string theory with, with what we see in the real world. That's somebody else's job, but I can tell you a little bit about what these people think. So what they think is that um, our world can be 10 dimensional, but four dimensions are really large and the other six are very small. It's like a wire, right? So if, if I show you a wire, you naturally would think, oh, the wire is one dimensional. I, I only tell you where you are. But in fact, the wire is just that the other dimension is very small and it's curled. So that's sort of the paradigm for why string theory is correct and, and how it, to describe the real world, it needs to be compactify on some some other spaces. So so that's uh, but again that's that's not my main area of expertise. I'm I'm perfectly happy living in ten or eleven dimensions. I don't think so. <laughs> okay, thank you. So there's a question by Bruce. Yes. Well, uh, first, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have uh, two simple questions because I don't know anything about uh, this subject. But the first question is, um, this correspondence uh, is one-to-one -one correspondence or there are two or more uh, equivalents, theories, uh, and the second, yeah. And the second right. one is, uh, this is a, a, a is there a um, experimental way to verify this uh, correspondence uh, measurement the entropy i don't know or oh, is just a theoretical uh, counting of theory very nice okay i'll i'll, I'll do my best answering uh, again i i emphasize i I am very mathematical and I, for me, uh, but I, 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 I try to answer it. Okay, so first of all, whether this is one-to-one -one or not, it is one-to-one. -one. So again, when it can be established, okay, it's not, it's not constructive. So if you tell me what is the gravity due to the standard model, I don't know. I, I only know this for certain theories because it comes from a string theory, it comes from some indication, but when it is known, this tells me, and, and this has been verified. Again, this, I don't like to appeal. I don't like, I grew up in Cuba, as, as, as Carol said. So I don't like to appeal to authority because for me, this is very cheap. But, uh, but this is an idea that has been around for 20 years and it has, I think, 18,000 citations. So these are, in the context of physics, this is very close to proof because nobody has ever found anything wrong with this idea. But what the idea tells you is that if you have a quantum field theory, then the quantum field theory and all its dynamics, its deformation, everything in that quantum field theory can be expressed or is equivalent mathematically to what is happening in a certain gravity theory. So in that sense, uh, everything. So you can now go and, and find any, any, any phenomena. For example, we know that certain quantum field theories, they have um, superconducting transition. You can say, hey, is there such a thing in gravity? And once you ask the question, then you try to, you have to reformulate the question in gravity. In gravity, you will have a, a Einstein equation. What does it mean to be superconducting? But when you're done, you will discover that yes, you found superconductivity on the gravity side. And many, many phenomena uh, have been established on, bo on both sides. Um, now, again, this is at the level, 
of most of the times what you can do with this is try to understand phenomena, but the phenomenology, the details. So can, can I now go and, and construct a model that will explain high TC superconductivity? No, that I cannot do. This is not the way uh, to do it. And, uh, but it helps you with conceptual issues. Like for example, for me particularly, there's so many questions about black holes. Um, since the seventies, people have been reading papers the paper in favor of something, paper against something, and there's no way to, to settle that because there's no independent technique. Now we have an independent technique uh, where I can do my counting of the entropy and see, yes, this counting is the entropy of the black hole, or even though, and I think the, the, the speaker, the, the person who, made the, who posed that question before, even though I don't know, I don't yet know what are the degrees of freedom, because of this correspondence, I can count them even though I cannot count them directly, I count them indirectly. So that's the kind of question where it, where it helps. Now, people have tried to use this as inspiration to, to, to construct phenomenological models, but that's a separate question. So yes, you can, you can try to, to turn a complicated field theory question into a question of gravity and solve it and then see if, if that applies. Uh, but that I, I would not claim that that has been super successful. To understand ideas like, symmetry breaking, patterns, uh, this kind of thing, yes, it is very useful, but for, for precise phenomenology, I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Bruno? Uh, professor, thank you yes. for the, the amazing talk. Uh, I'm still a student, so my question is a little basic. But uh, at the back background image you're using, it seems that yes. like you have uh, a black hole at the center. Yes. Surrounded by a shell with zeros and ones. And when I see these zeros and ones, I, I remember about quantum information theory. Yes. Can I talk a, a, a little about that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so this, is, this is really, I mean, this, as I said, I, this is a, a picture that, uh, uh, an artist of the American Physical Society helped me, you know, with this article. It was an article for, you know, to to divulge, right, to a divulgative a a article for all physicists. So it was supposed to be uh, this kind of more general for everybody. So I, I recommend that you take a look if you are interested. But but the idea is, is is precisely that that this is a quantum field theory, and in a quantum field theory, I can do my counting. And that's why it's zeros and one, uh, right? And then there's gravity, and then gravity. Now, more precisely, when people talk about holography, there's the idea of a hologram. So you have a surface, but the surface looks like it knows what's, you know, it, it has like some depth, right? So that's why this is also called holography, because in principle, you have a field theory living in the boundary. Let's call this the boundary. And then in the middle, you have the gravity. So the the asymptotic limit of the of the geometry is where the field theory lives, and that's why my figure here tried to to explain that when I go to the boundary, when I go to the end of a space, very far away from the black hole, where the field theory lives, there is where my quantum information about the black hole is. Now, this is not precisely a, a line of research that I'm exploring right now, but there is a lot of development right now on a string theory about the implication of quantum information and how to use techniques of quantum information to better understand black holes, much more in, in, in a more general uh, situation. For example, I was talking, all my talk was very, let's say, I would call it kinematic, right? I never talk about what the black hole does, what happens to the radiation, I'm just counting, right? So I, I'm just telling you this, I'm very good at counting and I count this number and this number matches with this other number. But there's of course development about the dynamics. So if the black hole is radiating and that radiation came from a pure state, uh, the entropy has to grow. But then at some point the entropy that, con the, the radiation that continues to come out of the black hole is entangled with the radiation that is still in the black hole and the entropy should go down. That's called the page curve. And, and people have now, uh, understood a little better how to treat that in the context of ads -CFT, and it's, it's quantum information uh, ideas that are really uh, helping us understand how to treat that. So that is absolutely uh, correct, yes. 
Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Now there is a question by Thaisa, please. Uh, hi, Leopoldo. Um, thanks for your the interesting talk. So uh, you have talked about uh, very recent uh, achievements within the ads CFT correspondence. And I was yes. wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the status of the DECITA CFT correspondence, if possible. Uh, sure, uh, I'm very glad. Um, thanks for the question. So the, there's, there's, of course, uh, a DS CFT correspondence. Um, however, however, um, I don't. I think at the moment it has not yet achieved the status uh, of ADS CFT because there are many, there are many, there are even conceptual issues. So in ADS CFT, the issue of of you know who's the observer and all these kind of things are, are very clear and and they are very relatively simple. In the sitter, there are many issues. There. Are I would like to separate the two in, in, in two groups. There are conceptual issues uh, about one, one, of, one of them is really where is the observer and, 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 and what, what are you supposed to measure, et cetera. And the other ones are just technical. So um, when I said that the ADS CFT renders the black hole information paradox vacuous, is because I know very well what is the theory that defines the field theory, and I know it's unitary, so I know that information cannot be lost. In the DS CFT correspondence, the CFT seems to have itself issues. It's not, it's not clearly uh, a, a unitary theory. It's a theory that you need to be very careful in how you define. Some people just do an analytic continuation. So let's say I have SUN, and then I, I allow my N, the rank of my group, to be negative. So there are always you know, steps that you need to take uh, that make it a little less, uh, at least to my taste, um, a little harder to treat. But, but I think, um, I think there have been also the work, for example, uh, not directly using the SCFT, but using ideas of ADSCFT to tackle questions uh, about, you know, correlation functions in an expanding universe, like in our universe, and try to help with that um, you know, with observation in, in inflation. So I think that what has happened, and this is more, I'm sorry that I have given you a very long answer, but I think that what has happened right now is that instead of trying to directly use DS CFT, people are using ideas of ADS to, to directly answer important questions in, in cosmology, uh, et cetera. And that's where I think the most, most, the, the most uh, trust is currently. Yeah, thanks for the answer. Sure. Are there more questions, comments? No. If there are no more questions, so we can uh, finish the, the recording. And I will, before that, uh, thanks Leopoldo again for the, for the nice talk. Sure.